season eight of the FIA World Endurance Championship was unmissable. The racing was thrilling, the drama electrifying. And the global pandemic certainly made it unique. Season 8 would mark the end of the LMP1 era, and to keep it competitive, there were changes afoot aimed at closing the gap between the hybrids and their rivals. With the new regulations this year, it, it definitely is going to be a tough battle between the, the privateers as well. Um, with the EOT, the success ballast coming up, I think it's good. We, we want to race. We, we want to be. We want to be fighting wheel to wheel for four hours, six hours, twenty-four hours, whatever the distance. The battle for LMP2 honours was looking intense. Top teams with top drivers and a tyre war too between Michelin and Goodyear. All added together. It was going to be an extremely tough competition. And for GTE, there was competition too. In both the AM and the Pro classes, with Aston Martin, Porsche and Ferrari going head to head. Every single lap is, is a quality lap now, these days. Everyone in GTE Pro is, is extremely competitive, the teams, the manufacturers and the drivers, so it's going to be close. Tension was mounting, nerves were jangling for the start of the season at Silverstone in Great Britain. cars were unleashed, the frantic charge into the first corner began and in LMP2 the track seemed barely wide enough to contain them all. United Autosports had been challenging for the lead early in the class but a sudden loss of power left Paul de Resta stranded out on track, the hopes of the team dashed on their World Endurance debut. Tough start at home as well for Team LNT. The wheels literally coming off their wagon. Mike Simpson managed to limp the LMP1 Ginetta back to the pits for repairs. No such dramas in the battle at the head of LMP2. Jop van Oetert for Racing Team Netherlands getting a good run down the hangar straight and going around the outside of Senior Tech Alpine's Andre Negrau to take the lead. Information to the pit lane, the track has been declared wet. Toyota decided to try and weather the short shower. But in the end, the rain proved just too heavy forcing them to bring both cars in for more suitable rubber. Team LNT was in the wars again, this time Oli Jarvis making contact with GT Ferrari driver Miguel Molina. Both spun, the Ferrari hit the barriers hard. That would bring out the safety car, and with the track drying rapidly, it gave just about everybody the opportunity to pit to get rid of their wet tyres. Rebellion's strategy had worked out better through the stops. The number three car had moved to the head of the race, but it wasn't long before Toyota was right back in it. Kamui Kobayashi attacking Pipo Durrani, using the hybrid four-wheel drive to retake the lead. Things hadn't quietened down in LMP2. Nico Lapierre for Cool Racing had reeled in racing team Netherlands' Jot van Oetert and slipped by him in traffic to grab the lead of the class. The GTE Pro, Alessandro Pierre Guidi in the remaining Ferrari had charged back after an early puncture. He was piling the pressure on Michael Christensen in the Porsche and then swept around the outside in Cop's corner to grab the lead with just under an hour to go. 
One Ferrari versus the field, and that one Ferrari was in the lead. The 92 Porsche's pace was fading. Teammate Jimmy Bruni in 91 caught Michael Christensen, swinging outside and inside to take second away. The move proved crucial. The Ferrari was handed a drive-through penalty for an indiscretion behind the safety car, ruining any hopes of victory. Things look better for Ferrari in GTEM. The number 83 AF Corsa car moving up into second in the class. Inside the final 10 minutes, the number one rebellion suddenly pitted. A power steering issue dropping them out of fourth place in LMP1. No such last minute woes for Toyota though. Jose Maria Lopez taking the chequered flag in car number seven to lead a Toyota 1-2 to the flag in the four hours of Silverstone. Big thank you to the team because they had to rebuild this car on uh, on Friday night and and they gave us a great car capable of winning as always. So um, yeah, big thank you to them. In GTE Pro, everything fell into place for Richard Leitz and Jimmy Bruni, who claimed the class win in the '91 Porsche. Victory in the season opener in LMP2 went to Cool Racing's Nico Lapierre and Antonin Borger. While Francois Perodo, Manu Collar and Nicolas Nielsen claimed GTE AM honours in the 83 AF Corsa Ferrari. <laughs> For round two, the championship headed to Japan. The 60th race in the history of the World Endurance Championship and Toyota had locked out the front row, but they immediately came under massive pressure as the Rebellion and the Ginettas were desperate to steal the lead into Turn 1. Behind, there was chaos in GTE AM. Satoshi Hoshino's Porsche smashed into the side of Paul Dallalana's Aston Martin. Both were forced to pit for repairs. Hoshino also found himself picking up a penalty. Rebellion's Bruno Senna had passed Kamui Kobayashi in the number seven Toyota for second place. On the long Fuji straight, the hybrid boost of the Toyota pulled him right back into contention, and Kobayashi blasted past. But when the boost ran out, the Rebellion was still accelerating hard, allowing Senna to fight back and reclaim the position as they got into traffic. they caught the GTE Pro Pack, Kobayashi spotted his opportunity. Senna was blocked. The Japanese driver positioned his car perfectly to go around the outside. In GTE Pro, Aston's Marco Sorensen was chasing Porsche's Jimmy Bruni for the lead. They both swept by the Black Gulf GTE and Porsche. The Aston, though, had the better line, the better momentum, and moved in front. Racing Team Netherlands' Fritz van Aert was leading LMP2, and as Fjordback had run him down in the number 33 high-class car and got alongside down the straight. Van Aert wasn't going to give this one up easily, but the inside line under braking eventually would tell, and high-class had the lead in LMP2. Three, three seconds open, you can update it. Okay, hopefully the range increase. Light rain was moving across Fuji Speedway, making the track increasingly slippery. But as at Silverstone, nobody wanted to pit unless it was absolutely necessary. LMP2 leader Anders Fjordback proved just how greasy the track was getting, skating out of the class lead. 
Toyota reacted quickly this time, pitting for slick intermediate tyres, determined not to give away their advantage as they so nearly did at Silverstone. Scary moment for Ginetta's Ben Hanley. A disc exploded under braking at the end of the 1.5 kilometer long straight, sending him straight on into the runoff. With 25 minutes left in the race, Nick de Vries was forced to pit for fuel, allowing Jota to close the gap for the LMP2 lead. As de Vries exited for Racing Team Netherlands, they weren't sure if they'd done enough and were nervously waiting to see if they had still managed to hold on to their race lead. to their relief? The answer was yes. After six hours of racing, it was the number eight Toyota that claimed victory, leading a team 1-2 at Fuji Speedway. The winners, Sebastian Buemi, Brendan Hartley and Kazuki Nakajima. For Nakajima, it was an impressive fourth win here in Fuji. Yeah, it's a great moment. Uh, we knew that we yeah, had to challenge the win and uh, it was a bit of pressure to achieve that, but uh, I'm really happy to be here in the end of the race. The win in GTE Pro went to Aston Martin's Dane train, Marco Sorensen and Nicky Team. In LMP2, Racing Team Netherlands claimed their first ever World Endurance win. And it was a big win too in GTE Am for TF Sport. Competition then crossed the East China Sea to Shanghai. <laughs> Rebellion had impressed in qualifying, taking the first non hybrid pole since 2012. But Norman Nato made a dreadful start, immediately losing his advantage and dropping back to fourth, with the fast starting Ginetta of Charlie Robertson grabbing the lead. And to prove the car's pace, Ben Hanley effortlessly sailed by the Toyota of Kamui Kobayashi on the back straight to take second. A moment of glory for the Yorkshire based manufacturer Ginetta. In GT Pro, it didn't take long for Nicky Team's Aston to grab the lead from the Porsche of Kevin Estra, who then had his mirrors full of a Ferrari, desperately trying to pass as well. Toyota was all too aware they had a fight on their hands in LMP1. They reacted quickly, releasing Sebastian Buemi for third in the hope of catching the Ginettas out front. The strategy worked. Coming out of the pits, Buemi just managed to squeeze by Ben Hanley in Ginetta number five. The Swiss driver then set about hunting down race leader Charlie Robertson. Both teams were double stinting tyres, but the Toyota was handling the older rubber better than the Ginetta. And with just over an hour of the race done, Toyota number eight was back on top. The LMP1 battle was just about to be turned on its head, and all thanks to the slow getaway of poleman Norman Nato. Pit lane stewards decision 20, 21 and 22 gave drive throughs for a jump start on cars 5, 6 and 7. Cars 5, 6 and 7 have a drive through for a jump start. All three had passed the number one rebellion before the start line. 
Team LNT immediately pitted their Ginettas to take their penalties, but any early advantage was ruined. And that left the number one rebellion back at the head of the pack. On a new set of Michelin tyres, Gustavo Menezes quickly caught and passed the unpenalised number eight Toyota to take the lead, undoing the damage of that tardy getaway. There was an all Aston Martin battle at the head of GTE Am, but the momentum was starting to swing towards TF Sports' red number 90 car ahead of the 98 AMR machine. In the pro class, it was all going wrong for the lead Aston with a puncture. The tyre let go on the long, fast back straight, forcing Marco Sorensen off track and dropping them down the order. The advantage was now with the AF Corsa Ferrari of Alessandro Pierre Guidi, suddenly handed a very healthy lead. The 97 Aston Martin of Maxime Martin was in second place, but Kevin Estra in the 92 Porsche was determined not to let him keep it. He was on the attack. Aston in front of you is for position two. He has a used front right, who has used full right side. You have four new tyres for the rest of the In the closing stages, it was the Porsches who had the best pace. Jimmy Bruni next up to attack the 97 Aston. He had to use his arms and elbows, though, to squeeze by for third. As race leader Bruno Senna headed towards the chequered flag, history was about to be made. Welcome home, mate. Welcome home. It would be victory in the four hours of Shanghai for the number one rebellion. The first outright win for a privateer team in LMP1. It's fantastic for us, great job from the team. We didn't do any mistakes. I think our race was very, very clean and uh, we were fast, so we took the win. Awesome job. In GTE Pro, victory went to the Ferrari of James Collado and Alessandro Chiaguidi. LMP2 honours went to the Jota squad. The first win in LMP2 for the new Goodyear tyre. And in GTE Am, it was a second straight win for Sally Olick, Johnny Adam, and Charlie Eastwood. Round four was in the heat of the desert. The eight hours of Bahrain started with an all non-hybrid front row. Rebellion on pole, Tinetta alongside. It was close at the start, but Senna held his line into the first turn, fending off Charlie Robertson. But as they got to turn two, Robertson spun on coal tyres, connecting with Senna, putting them both into a spin and sending cars in all directions. The main beneficiary of the chaos was Toyota's Mike Conway. Somehow he missed everything and was handed a big lead. Sebastian Buemi carried on with damage on the front end of the number eight Toyota, the team opting not to replace it until the scheduled pit stop. Bruno Senna had also pushed on after the melee at the start, anxious to recover the ground lost in the number one rebellion. But by the time he'd handed over to teammate Gustavo Menezes, he was still livid. In GTE Pro, it was turning into a battle of nerves for the lead. Oh, the train makes sense. 
Aston Martin's Nicky team was leading, defending on older tyres from fellow Dane Michael Christensen. The Porsche driver also had pressure from behind, the Ferrari of Alessandro Pierre Guidi. The Italian spotted a chance to get alongside and sneaked by the 92 Porsche into second place. Pierre Guidi was flying on the very next lap. He made a carbon copy move on the Aston Martin and was through into the lead. The lead battle in GTE Am was all about Porsche. The number 57 Project One machine and the 86 Gulf Porsche dicing for the advantage. Behind them, in another Porsche, it all went dramatically wrong for Khaled El Kubesi, who lost control under braking at the end of the straight. In the Pro Class 2, Porsche was in trouble. A damper failure, forcing Kevin Estra in the 92 car into the garage. It wasn't long before the sister car was also forced in for an unscheduled pit stop. A puncture had damaged Jimmy Bruni's right front wheel and urgent repairs were required. The battle now was Ferrari versus Aston Martin. They were locked together in a tight embrace, but ever so slightly, the advantage seemed to be creeping towards the British team. LMP2 had also become a two-way fight between Jota and United Autosports. The lead seesawed between them varying on pit stop strategy. This was set to go all the way to the flag. As the clock wound down for the final racing lap of 2019, the LMP1 victory went to the number seven Toyota. Gifted the lead right at the start, they never looked back. An important win and vital for their championship hopes. Pro, there was a second win for the number 95 Aston Martin. The Dane train's early defence had paid dividends for Marco Sorensen and Nicky Team. Ferrari definitely brought us to us right in the end, and by the team not doing any mistakes, it's basically how we won. Uh, but wow, what a race! In LMP2, it was an impressive first win in the World Endurance Championship for United Autosports. And in GTE Am, victory went to the number 57 Porsche from Team Project One. For the first race of 2020, the WEC rolled into the USA. Rebellion again had pole ahead of the Toyotas, and this time Bruno Senna was determined to stay in front and out of trouble as the field charged up the hill in Austin. Once more in GTE Pro, a six-car juggernaut battled away. Aston Martin with the early advantage. Uh, we're doing one stand on these tires, but let's try to take care of them so they're good at the end. Austin saw the GTE Pro debut of the all new mid engined Corvette, though it wasn't quite on front running pace just yet. The 
just over 90 minutes gone, it was suddenly all change in LMP2. An exploding brake disc sent the leading 36 senior tech Alpine scurrying to the pits, handing the advantage to Racing Team Nederland. But before long, their driver Fritz van Ed was struggling to hold off the hard charging Anders Fjord back. The day in the high class racing entry squeezed by to take the lead of the class. Roberto Gonzalez was next to attack, but the Jota driver misjudged the gap, clipping Van Ed into a spin as he went through. If anything, in GTE Pro, the battle looked even tighter. It seemed only smart strategy and clean pit work might be able to make the difference. Aston and Porsche tried differing tyre strategies, but they were still locked together in combat. An early mistake on tyre pressures by United Autosport had forced them to switch strategy, but they were pushing hard to get back into the LMP2 fight. Paul de Resta taking no prisoners on their comeback, charging by Jota Sports' Antonio Felix da Costa. Rebellion led, but was Toyota's pressure starting to pay? Toyota had another potential ace up their sleeve. Their hybrid cars were putting in an extra lap on each fuel run. Using less fuel meant they may just be able to escape with one fewer pit stop at the end of the race. All of that left Rebellion with just one option, to go flat out to the chequered flag. GTE Pro, Jimmy Bruni was limping on with an electrical issue, but falling further and further behind. Inside the final half hour, and Ferrari's James Collado and Aston Martin's Alex Lynn were in a flat out wheel to wheel, door banging drag race for the final podium spot in GTE Pro, neither willing to yield an inch. World champion Collado somehow managed to break a fraction later as they ran out of straight. In GTE Am, it had been a race-long battle between the Aston Martins as we'd seen in China. But in the closing stages, TF Sport just crept in front. And the red car eased out its advantage all the way to the flag. United Autosports needed a fuel stop with just under 20 minutes to go. They'd been running out of sync with the other LMP2 teams, but had now cycled through to the lead. The 37 Jackie Chan DC Racing Team was trying to charge them down, but as the 22 car left the pits, they had just enough of an advantage to stay ahead. In LMP1, the relief on the faces of Norman Nato and Bruno Senna was clear to see as their teammate Gustavo Menezes approached the chequered flag in what had been a tense race. Rebellion claiming their second win of the season at the Lone Star Le Mans. Another impressive result for the privateer team against the factory might of Toyota. Yeah. We won, we did it. Uh, incredible effort from all the team, from the boys, from Norman, Bruno, and even more from all the mechanics that rebuilt our engine yesterday right before qualifying. Um, thank you so much to everyone, P1. In GTE Pro, Nicky team brought the Dane train Aston Martin across the line for a third win for the 95 machine. <laughs> United Autosports made it back-to-back -back LMP2 victories. And TF Sport were back on top in GTE Am.
nobody expected what happened next. Lockdown. It's been too long. You know, we've been uh, lots of phone calls and Zoom calls, you know. Um, but yeah, now to be back on the circuit, it's, uh, it's cool. It has been a very long time since um, since Austin, so it's more than I mean, six months, more than six months without racing, uh, which for a racing driver is not perfect. As travel restrictions eased during the COVID pandemic, racing was allowed to resume. Spa would be behind closed doors, but after 172 days away, everyone was happy to be back. It's been a long time uh, that we haven't been at the racetrack. It's been nice to be back. Obviously, we miss the fans. I think that's clear, and it's going to be the same at Le Mans. But we're all very much looking forward to the competition and, and going racing again. I've been trying to do uh, a bunch of simulator racing, so online racing, just to you know keep the the brain with the rhythm and the car driving thing. But uh, nothing like being back in the car. But as the cars were about to head out to the grid, the heavens opened, flooding the track, just to add to the challenge for anyone feeling a little race rusty. Race has started in the number one rebellion again led the field away for four laps behind the safety car. And once that had pitted, it was back to green. As they charged to the line, Tom Dillman in the Bicollis, who'd qualified fourth, was quickly challenging the Toyotas, but he couldn't find a way through. And by the time they were heading out of the hairpin at La Source, the four-wheel drive of Toyota's hybrid system was a clear advantage for Wemi and Conway shooting by the race leader. And on the next lap, Tom Dillman also got by Norman Nato. The rebellion was plainly struggling in the slippery going. The race leader was losing ground with a hybrid system problem. Despite this, Sebastian Buemi pushed on, but he had to head to the pits. By the time the number eight car had stopped, Mike Conway was in front in number seven. Buemi's exasperation was evident. GTE Pro lead battle was Ferrari versus Porsche. By now on slicks with nothing between them, Kevin Escher in the 92 car got the toe up the Kemmel straight to make his move. And with the number 33 LMP2 car coming through as well, Pierre Guidi had no way of counter-attacking. Then disaster for the GTE Pro championship leaders. Marco Sorensen crawled back to the pits with the puncture, but they were now last in class. With the weather starting to worsen once more, the number seven Toyota pitted from the lead. Mike Conway handing over to Kamui Kobayashi as the team swapped them back onto wet weather tyres. Number eight followed suit. Sebastian Buemi handing over to Brendan Hartley. Once more, fresh wet weather tyres to try and stay in touch with number seven. In GTE Am, the battle for the lead had been between the Porsches, but in the wetter conditions, they started to struggle. The advantage was moving towards AF Corsa's Ferraris. Francois Perodo passed his title rivals in the TF Sport Aston to move up to third. And then Giancarlo Fisichella also sneaked by the red Aston Martin of Sally Olic. Points leaders now down to fifth. In the battle for GTE, Pro Honours, Ferrari gambled, pitting early to switch back to slicks. Yeah, copy. So 97 went on wet, 51 on slicks. We're watching last time. I'll update you. As everyone watched the 51 Ferrari's pace, it became clear that slicks were the right way to go. Ferrari's gamble had paid off and everybody else had to follow suit. The 92 Porsche quickly into the pits for dry weather rubber. Oh. 
LMP2 had been close all the way through between Racing Team Nederland and United Autosports, both previous winners already in the season. But Fritz van Ed couldn't hold off Paul de Resta, the ex-Grand Prix ace diving by the supermarket magnet to grab the lead at the hairpin. And Fritz was soon under pressure from Tom Laurent in the Senior Tech Alpine. At one of the fastest parts of the track there was contact and a huge crash for the Frenchman. The car was destroyed, but mercifully, Laurent was unharmed. After six tough hours at Spa, Mike Conway crossed the line to take the win in Toyota number seven. Check the play on car seven. Check the play on car seven. A third win in the season for the crew of number seven. In LMP2, a third win as well for United Autosports, extending their championship advantage. In GTE Pro, there was a first win for the reigning champions. But was it all too little, too late for Porsche's Kevin Estra and Michael Christensen? So not easy. Uh, we didn't drive on the rain here since a while, uh, and it was 20 degrees less. So difficult to find the right tire, the right tire pressure. We struggled a bit on the first two uh, two stints on the rain, but then we found the, the right compromise, and uh, and our pace on the dry was good. Strategy was perfect. So uh, so really happy with this victory. In GTE Am, it was an important win for the number 83 Ferrari. It put them right back in the title hunt. Race celebrations were a little different. Everybody was socially distancing, but winning meant no less to the drivers for all that. Next, the big one but it was a very different Le Mans in 2020 without any fans at the Circuit de la Sarthe. But the racing would go on. And there was still everything to play for in the championships. There was even a tantalizing glimpse of the future as Toyota returned the trophy in a prototype of their new hypercar. The French tricolor arrived in style from above. French army presented the flag to Carlos Tavares, the CEO of Peugeot, the car manufacturer announcing that they will return to Le Mans in 2022. To fight. Red, white and blue was waved to start the 24 hours. The 59 car grid was released. Polman Mike Conway under immediate pressure from Bruno Senna in the Rebellion, approaching the Dunlop chicane for the first of many times. Likewise, Sebastian Buemi was just as keen to grab second place from Senna. He briefly got ahead, but Senna rallied and closed the door. GTE Pro, Porsche had won the qualifying battle, but their race pace was not as strong. It wasn't long before James Collado was ahead in the number 51 AF Corsa Ferrari. With three hours gone, the number 71 Ferrari was out front. 
Belgium's Maxi Martin stole the lead in the 97 Aston Martin. G-Drive had taken the lead in LMP2, but a sudden loss of power nine hours into the race forced Russian driver Roman Rusinov to pull over. The lead battle was now between the pair of United Autosport cars. They ran side by side down the Mulsanne Strait. Eventually, the number 22 machine squeezed in front. The race seemed to be going the way of the number seven Toyota, but at just over mid distance, they were in trouble and forced into the pits. Kamui Kobayashi's body language said it all. He knew it was serious and their one lap advantage over their rivals in the number eight machine was gone. Okay, Brendan, and for your info, uh, car seven is in the pit for a problem with the turbo. So, heads up, we have to finish the race. The Toyota Gazoo Racing Mechanics did fix the problem, but it was almost 30 minutes before car number seven returned to the track. Le Mans was starting to take its toll. In GTEM, the 98 Aston Martin was leading but was forced to stop and replace all the brakes on the car. AMR's problems handed the lead to their Aston Martin rivals, TF Sport. The end almost in sight, the number eight Toyota was starting to look comfortable at the head of the pack. But Le Mans history tells us, and Toyota in particular, that nothing is for granted. With just over an hour left, the number three rebellion developed a clutch problem. The team struggling to stop the wheels spinning as they tried to push the car back into the garage. And that delayed the number one rebellion, which pitted at the same time, having to wait for the other car to be moved clear. It had been a challenging 24 hours, but in the end, it all came good for the number eight crew. Victory at Le Mans, handing Toyota the team's championship. What the luck, guys! Incredible. The win also gave the crew of number eight the lead in the drivers' championship. It feels great to win it for a second time with a different manufacturer. Um, but not seeing the fans um, with us in the grandstands and, and through the pits, it does feel a bit sad. So I guess I just want to send a message to them that we miss you and we want to see you next year and, and you're a big part of the race. Victory in LMP2 went to United Auto Sports number 22 machine, giving them the team's title as well. <laughs> In GTE Pro, Aston Martin were first and third, taking the FIA World Manufacturer's crown. We struggled the last two years properly, and uh, we came back stronger. We, we worked hard, and uh, we had a very competitive car. To win Le Mans here for Aston Martin is just fantastic. GTE honours also went to Aston Martin, Tom Ferrier's TF Sports squad on the top step of the Le Mans podium.
443 days after the season opened at Silverstone, the finale was once more in Bahrain. It was also the end of the LMP1 era. We achieve 50% less fuel consumption, 50% less use of tyres, but yet faster race times and lap times than just a decade ago. And this is Le Mans, this is prototype racing, and that's what we had. Be happy we had it, and also be happy what's coming. I remember that GT1 days, uh, really cool cars, hypercars, will have again the recipe to fascinate people. We are creating a platform for more people to join. This is uh, the WEC, this is Le Mans, and this is what I'm looking forward to. As the eight hours of Bahrain got underway, everyone knew what they needed to do, but that wasn't going to make it any easier. In GTE Pro, it was evident the race was going to be as tough as ever. Likewise, in GTE Am, there was an early scare for TF Sport when the AMR Aston spun and hit the points leaders. In LMP1, it was simple. Whichever Toyota team won the race, would be the world champions. The number seven car had an advantage in pace. Nothing that number eight did seemed to make much difference. Why we didn't do what we said we could do? Just tell me, was it confused? Gap too big to jump. Gap too big to jump. As night fell, disaster for the 51 Ferrari. Daniel Serra clipped an AM-class Porsche, damaging a rear wheel. The car needed urgent repairs, ruling James Collado out of the GTE Pro title battle. And then another title contender fell by the wayside. Maxime Martin was in trouble. The 95 Aston had already pitted for new brakes. It was almost inevitable the 97 car would have to do so too. But when he came in, Martin knew it would be the end of his title hopes as well. And Aston Martin's brake problems weren't just confined to the pro cars. The GTE AM points leader also struggled. TF Sport had to make a full brake change dropping them down the order. And that swung the championship advantage towards the 83 AF Corsa Ferrari. Saving their tyres early on, they were now rejuvenated and a move up into second position put the title out of reach of the struggling Aston Cruz. LMP2 had witnessed a race-long battle at the front between the Jota Sport and Jackie Chan DC Racing crews. But with less than 10 minutes to go, Gabriel Aubrey somehow spotted the gap and went for it. Antonio Felix da Costa was not expecting him there and was forced out wide. Da Costa tried to fight back, but Aubrey had the better line on the back straight, held his nerve and grabbed the lead. They were heading for a good year 1-2. There was a last lap moment of drama for race leader Kamui Kobayashi as Ben Keating ran wide in the Porsche. But the number seven Toyota rounded the final corner to take the chequered flag, waved by the outgoing championship CEO Gérard Neveu, marking the end of an incredible sports car racing era. Congratulations to the winner. Congratulations to the winner. It had been a dominant performance, sealing the World Championship for Kamui Kobayashi, Jose Maria Lopez and Mike Conway. We're glad that we can still be racing and uh, yeah, to clinch his world title is uh, amazing. Great job from the team, my teammates, you know, they've been all flawless um, all year, you know, so uh, huge credit to them and um, yeah, they make me look good. In LMP2, more emotion. A final swan song win for Jackie Chan DC Racing before they bow out of world endurance. In GTE Pro, the race victory went to the 92 Porsche of Michael Christensen and Kevin Escher, but they waved their championship titles goodbye to Aston Martin and the Dane Train. We, yeah, we finally clinched the, the second world title. 
and we do it together again. Uh, it's yeah, you cannot you yeah, you cannot really put words to it. In GCEM, the race win went to the number 56 Team Project One Porsche, but the title was heading to Ferrari. The GTE Am team's trophy went to AF Corsa, the driver's crown to Manu Collar, Francois Perodo, and Niklas Nielsen. Aston Martin Racing claimed the FIA GTE Manufacturers Championship. Marco Sorensen and Nicky Team winning the GTE driver's title. Top honours in LMP2 went to United Autosports after a massively impressive debut season. Philippe Albuquerque and Phil Hansen won the driver's title. The final ever LMP1 Teams Championship went to Toyota Gazoo Racing as Jose Maria Lopez, Kamui Kobayashi and Mike Conway were crowned world champions. The longest season ever marks the end of one era and the beginning of the next.